Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on communicable diseases. Now, before you watch this video, make sure you're confident with the basics of animal, plant, and bacterial cells and their structures and how they work and so on. I've got a video on that earlier in the playlist, should you need. In this video, we will be talking about health and well being in general, looking at the difference between communicable and non communicable diseases, the, what we mean by opportunistic infections. Then we'll look at the different types of pathogen, how those pathogens are spread, and finally, we'll look at sexually transmitted infections. Let's look, first of all, at health and well-being. So when we talk about health, we're talking about a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. So what does that mean? Physical well-being is about being free of injury and disease. And that's too often where we stop when we think about our health. But we know how important our mental health is too. So your mental well-being is about being free of mental illnesses, you know, not having depression, anxiety, uh, and so on. And more generally, feeling good within yourself. And then finally, we've got our social well-being. You know, they say that no man or perhaps no person is an island. And that's what social well-being is about. Social well-being is about having meaningful connection to others. It's about loving people and being loved by people. And if you don't have all three of those things in place, you can't describe yourself as fully healthy. And we will all find that, you know, some aspects of our physical health aren't great, but our mental and social health might be good. And so all of us will have a kind of a mixed picture with those. But good health is about having the balance of all three of those things. Poor health um, happens when those things aren't in place. Now, in this unit, we're focusing overwhelmingly on physical health and particularly looking at the disease part of physical health. So disease is any problem with the body that is not caused by injury. And that's the kind of definition we're going to be working with. On this slide, we're going to look at the different categories of disease. Now, our first category of diseases is ones like colds, the flu, COVID, HIV, malaria, tuberculosis. What these have all got in common is that they can be passed from one person to another. You will all have had the experience of catching a cold from your brother or your sister or your mum or your dad or your nan or, or your friends or something like that. You will, most of you have had the experience of catching COVID from someone you know and love as well. So diseases that can be passed on from one person to another are referred to as communicable diseases. Communicable just means that they can be communicated. They can be passed on from one person to another person. And we sometimes use this word contagious to describe diseases like that. Now, these communicable diseases or contagious diseases are caused by harmful microorganisms, which we refer to as pathogens. So that's things like bacteria and viruses that we're going to look at in more detail. Uh, over the rest of the uh, video. Now, our second group of diseases is things like um, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, that's heart disease, um, dementia, you know, when particularly older people uh, start to lose their memories. All of those diseases, and they are horrible, horrible diseases, are different to the ones above because these cannot be passed on. You can't catch cancer from someone. You can't catch diabetes from someone and so on. Now, we call diseases like this non-communicable. So a non-communicable disease is one that cannot be passed from one person to another. Another word to describe this, we can say they are non-contagious diseases. Doesn't mean they're less bad diseases, it just means they're different, they're caused uh, in different ways. Now, the causes of non-communicable diseases are, there are two different ones. First one is about your genes. Some of us just have bad luck and inherit genes that end up causing disease. Other um, causes are down to our lifestyle. So lifestyle is about things like your diet, what you eat. Is it too much, too little, the wrong kinds of things, whatever it might be. Um, how much do we exercise? Do we smoke? Do we drink? And so on. All of those can contribute to our chances of developing these non-communicable diseases. Now, before we look in detail at the types of pathogen, 
it's just worth looking at the idea of opportunistic infections. Now, the idea here is that the presence of one disease often makes it more likely that you'll develop another. And the reason why is that the immune system, which is how we fight disease, can be weakened by one disease, which makes it harder to um, prevent a second one from coming along. So, for example, one way this might happen is that some diseases can make it easier for our others to enter our body by damaging our defences. So, for example, if you've got gum disease, and that can happen if you don't brush your teeth regularly enough, for example, um, that can actually allow bacteria to enter from the mouth directly into the blood, and that can then infect the heart and lead to heart disease. So, if you don't brush your teeth regularly, perhaps now's the time to start because your poor toothbrushing may actually uh, end up causing heart disease, which is something that none of us uh, would want. So now we're going to look at the different types of pathogen. And our first kind of pathogen is bacteria. Now, bacteria are single-celled organisms with no nucleus, so the DNA is floating freely in the cytoplasm. Also, the DNA has no unused sections, but the main, the main thing is about them not having that nucleus. Now, before we talk about some examples of diseases caused by bacteria, it's really important to note that most bacteria are not pathogenic. Most bacteria are completely harmless. I kind of feel a bit sorry for bacteria sometimes because they get they get a really bad rap. Um, but actually, we need bacteria to survive. We've got trillions of them in our digestive systems helping to digest our food. Like, we'll be super unhealthy without them. So we need bacteria. However, sometimes some bacteria can make us ill as well. And there are three specific examples that we need to know about on the edX cell syllabus. And the first one um, is the is tu tuberculosis, which is caused by bacteria. And this is a very serious um, disease that causes very serious uh, lung damage. Now, we're really lucky in the UK that um, tuberculosis is very rare. Most of you will have had tuberculosis vaccines, but tuberculosis around the world kills something like 1.2 million people every year. So this is a this is a really serious thing. The next um, bacterial disease that we need to know about is cholera. Now, cholera, um, and we, we can see some cholera bacteria there. Cholera um, causes life-threateningly severe diarrhea. So diarrhea is runny liquid poo. And when you've got cholera, um, essentially you die from dehydration because you might drink all you want, but it just runs straight through and out the other end. Um, and it's, this is a very, very serious illness, particularly in children, uh, you know, young children and babies who can die from this, you know, within uh, a, a very small number of days. Now, the number of deaths from cholera is very variable. It's about 80,000 per year, um, but it varies. To, you know, it happens. It, you get these outbreaks, particularly when there's something like an earthquake that damages water and sewage systems. And the last disease we need to know about is chlamydia. Now, chlamydia won't kill you for the most part, um, but it has symptoms like pain when you're peeing, um, a, an unpleasant discharge from the vagina or penis, whichever one you've got, um, and infertility, which is the inability to um, have children. Now, this affects, um, in the UK alone, something like 200,000 cases per year, and is increasing rapidly. So this is, although it won't kill you, it's a pretty unpleasant thing to have, and it's certainly something to take pretty seriously. Our next kind of pathogen is viruses. Now, viruses are a little bit different to other types of living things that you've come across because they aren't alive in their traditional sense. You know, they they don't have a metabolism. The virus is 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 not respiring. It's not growing proteins. It's or producing proteins. It's not really doing anything until it hijacks a cell. So let's have a look. A virus is either some DNA or RNA. RNA is essentially similar to DNA, but has a single strand rather than a double strand. And it is surrounded, this DNA and RNA is surrounded by a protein coat. So, so that's what the virus is, the DNA or RNA surrounded by a protein coat. And what it does is they hijack cells and force them to make more copies of the virus. And that process destroys the cell. And that, that's one of the, the things that causes the damage of a viral infection. Now, there is only one disease that you need to know um, is caused by viruses, and that is HIV AIDS. So HIV is the human immunodeficiency virus, and it attacks and kills 
white blood cells. So it reproduces in those white blood cells, destroying them in the process. Um, now, white blood cells help us to fight off other infections. And when enough of the white blood cells are being killed by HIV, that leads to the very serious disease that we call AIDS. Now, AIDS is less of a problem than it used to be. So in the early 2000s, when AIDS was at its peak, around 1.6 million people around the world were dying every year from AIDS. Now it's only, he says, quote unquote, around 700,000. So still a hell of a lot of people. Um, this is a really serious, really nasty um, disease. There are other diseases also caused by viruses that you don't need to know about for the um, syllabus. And things like, you know, most of the colds you get are caused by viruses. Um, COVID caused by a virus. The flu is caused by a virus um, and so on. So lots of diseases are caused by viruses. But the one we need, the one we need to know about is HIV AIDS. Now, our next kind of pathogen is protists. Protists aren't something that many of you would have heard of before, but a protist is a single celled organism, a bit like a bacterium. However, the big difference is that they've got a nucleus this time, so they work very differently. Now, there's only one disease that you need to know about, which is caused by a protist, and that is malaria. And malaria is a very serious illness that causes damage to the blood and the liver. And this is a really big deal. Again, we're, we're really lucky that we don't have malaria uh, in the UK. But malaria kills something like 700,000 people every year. Um, and that's down from much higher numbers previously. So, for example, in the 20th century, um, somewhere between 150 and 300 million people were killed by malaria. So this is a really, really big deal. Um, and what malaria does is it damages our, our red blood cells. So you can see here, there is the malaria protest, protest to start with, and it grows and grows and grows and eventually destroys um, our white blood cell, uh, red blood cells. Now, our final kind of pathogen is fungi. So fungi, the plural of fungus. Um, fungi are multicellular organisms that have got cell walls and they digest their food um, outside their bodies. Again, there is only one disease we need to know about that is caused by fungi, um, and that is a disease in ash trees. Um, uh, ash trees are trees like this that have, have leaves that look like that. And the disease is called Chalera ash dieback. And what Chalera ash dieback does is it causes the leaves, causes the leaves to wilt and die. So there, that is some ash leaves that have been affected by Chalera ash dieback. Um, and also it causes these lesions, which is kind of open dead areas on the trunk of the tree. So you can see one of those lesions there on that tree trunk. And this kills ash trees very, very quickly. Now you might be thinking, well, it's only a tree. What does it matter? But ash trees are a really important part of the ecosystem, supporting the lives of many insects and birds that depend on them. And if they are if they're, they're harmed by this disease, which is spreading rapidly, throughout the ash trees in the UK at the moment, then that will have big knock-on effects for the overall health of our ecosystem. Now we've seen what the different types of pathogens are, it's time to look at how they spread. And the first way that um, pathogens spread is what we call the airborne um, route. So airborne is exactly what it sounds like. It's when pathogens spread through the air. So someone breathes them out and we breathe them in and get infected. And there are just a couple of examples that we need to know about with this. The first one is tuberculosis. So in tuberculosis, infected people cough out droplets uh, that contain the bacteria. And we can see an example of that here. So actually every time we cough, we spray out this spray of tiny little droplets. That photograph has just been lit specially to show up the droplets more clearly. Now, some of those droplets will contain the bacteria. And if someone else breathes uh, one of those droplets in, then they can become infected with the tuberculosis bacteria. That's why um, during the COVID pandemic, because COVID also spreads um, through the airborne route, um, that's why we're encouraged to wear face masks. Whether it worked well or not is a, a, a bit up for debate, but the theory at least is sound. I, the idea there is that by wearing those masks, you filter out some of those droplets, making it less likely that you'll get infected. Now, the other example we need to know about is the tree disease, Chalera ash dieback. Um, that's a type of fungus. Fungi um, uh, 
typically reproduce by releasing these tiny, tiny little cells called spores, which are a bit like seeds. And those spores will float through the air and then land on another ash tree and infect it as well. Uh, that, by the way, is why Chalera ash dieback is so hard to contain and control, because how do you stop things floating about on the wind? There are other common examples as well that um, you will have come across. Um, so colds, the flu, COVID, they're also spread by the airborne um, route as well. Now, our second method uh, of disease spread is the waterborne route. Um, and much like with airborne, this does exactly what it says. This is when diseases are spread through contaminated water. So if we drink contaminated water, then we can pick up the or uh, b become infected with the um, pathogens that might be in it. Um, now, there's only one example that we need to know about for this, and that is cholera. So when um, so if you remember, cholera is sort of life threateningly serious diarrhea. And if the infected diarrhea from one person ends up contaminating someone else's drinking water, then when they get that drink, when, when they drink that water, they will um, be infected with the cholera bacteria and they will develop cholera as well. Now, we're really lucky in the UK because most of us have a bathroom, perhaps something like that, where the taps um, and the uh, toilet are completely separate. They're completely separate systems. The um, waste that's flushed down the toilet will never um, directly contact the water that is coming out of the taps. However, in some countries, particularly developing countries, that's not always the case. And that particularly uh, can happen uh, during natural disasters as well. You know, earthquakes and floods and things like that can cause that mixing of drinking water and waste water, sewage water. Um, and that's when cholera can erupt in a big outbreak. Um, and we can see an example of that here. You can imagine in that situation how uh, diarrhea could contaminate someone's drinking water. There are other examples as well. So um, you might have heard of diseases like dysentery. Um, recently, uh, I'm, I'm recording this in 2024, um, in around sort of May 2024, there was an outbreak of cryptosporidium um, caused by contaminated drinking water in the UK, uh, down in Devon. So these things can happen in the UK, but they're much less common because we do generally have good and safe water supply. The third way that diseases can be transmitted that we need to know about is what we call animal vectors. Now, in an animal vector, a vector is an animal that can bite you and pierce the skin and pa it passes the pathogens directly into the blood. So the, the one example that we need to know about for the LXL syllabus is malaria. So malaria, most people know, is spread by mosquito bites. And so the mosquito isn't trying to give you malaria. The mosquitoes trying to get a tasty, tasty meal of your blood. However, some mosquitoes are infected with the protist that causes malaria. And as it bites you, the, the protist can be passed from the mosquito directly into your bloodstream and therefore infect you with malaria. Now, we're really fortunate. We don't have mosquitoes that carry malaria in the UK. It's possible. Global warming may change that, but it's not an issue right now. There are other examples as well of diseases that are spread through animal vectors. So um, you probably know from history about the Black Death or bubonic plague that was spread by flea bites, um, again, acting as an animal vector. Um, and another uh, really nasty disease called rabies, um, which is spread through mammal bites. Again, we're lucky in the UK that neither bubonic plague or rabies is found in our wild animal populations. Now, the last um, method of disease transmission we need to know about, and it's perhaps the most important one in terms of you and your lives and lives and your, your sort of decision making in your lives, is sexually transmitted infections. Now, sexually transmitted infections are infections that spread as the result of unprotected sexual activity. Now, really important to note, we're not just talking about sexual intercourse here, but we're talking about all sexual activity where sexual fluids of person A directly contact um, person B. Now, in terms of required examples, number one is HIV, which we know can lead to the condition called AIDS. But also, there is chlamydia as well. But there are lots of other sexually transmitted infections as well, things like syphilis, gonorrhea, genital warts, and so on. None of them are pleasant. All of them need to be taken seriously. Um, and so we need to consider what can we do to prevent the spread of sexually transmitted infections? Well, 
The only guaranteed way to do it is to avoid sexual contact. That's not a realistic prospect for most adults in their lives, but that is one way to prevent their spread. Um, a second way to prevent their spread is the use of barrier contraception. So that's contraception that forms a physical barrier to prevent the direct contact of the two different people's sexual fluids. And what we're talking about here is condoms or femidoms. Now, you've got to be really careful about how you answer exam questions around this. Don't just say protection. Protection is not specific enough. Also, for similar reasons, don't just say contraception. And the reason why is there are plenty of types of contraception, for example, the contraceptive pill, that have absolutely zero effect in terms of preventing the spread of sexually transmitted infections. They will reduce the chance of pregnancy, but they have no impact on STIs. So we've got to be specific. Either say barrier contraception or condoms and femidoms. Now, um, the other thing that's important is sexual health testing. So at some point in your lives, you know, you're likely to get married or likely to want to start having children with someone and you will start having unprotected sex. And the very clear advice is before you do that, go to a sexual health testing clinic and make sure that neither of you have an infection that you might pass on to your partner. And that's just general good advice as well to anyone who's having regular sex is to get regular sexual health testing. It's free under the NHS. It's discreet. It's confidential. Um, you don't even have to give your real name, you know, but it's really important to know whether you do or don't have some of these infections because a lot of them don't show any symptoms for quite a long time, but can still be passed on during that point where, um, where they are symptom free. And just a little public um, service announcement, um, the, there is the National Sexual Health Helpline that you can phone to get advice about where your nearest clinic is and how to go about it. Uh, and the number for that is 0300 123 7123. Okay, so that's it, the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.